Hi, my name is Andrew Opelt, and today I'm going to be talking about measuring code coverage of the Linux kernel in accordance with DO178C considerations. So if you're not familiar with a lot of the terms in that title, that's fine. Um, I'm planning to introduce both code coverage and DO178C, so hopefully you can leave here with at least understanding those with some basic detail. Uh, for a little bit of background, for some context, I work for Boeing, and we're actually looking to use Linux in a number of safety critical applications. However, as it stands today, it's not really possible. So code coverage is just one of the many you know, hurdles that we need to jump over in order to use Linux in um, avionics software. So, Quick overview. Um, we're going to talk about what the safety standards are, why discuss code coverage at all, the types of code coverage that there are, because there's a handful of types, uh, what tools exist today to measure those, and then some work that we've done with the University of Illinois to actually enhance um, some open source tools to do this for us instead of the commercial tools. And then a little spoiler on what tool that is, but talking about LVM Cub today and where we see it going in the future. Yeah. Champagne. Uh, champagne. So to get started with software safety standards, uh, the primary one I'm going to be talking about today is DO178C. And that's the, the, the fundamental one for avionics software, for commercial avionics software. That's used both in North America by the FAA and in the EU by YASA. So when you're talking about certifying safety critical software in the avi avionics industry, that's really what we're talking about. And DO-178C defines five software levels or design assurance levels. They're called DALs for short. And these five levels uh, define a number of requirements for how you need to develop your software and how you need to prove that it's safe. Um, the, the categorization is based on what would happen if your software were to fail. So if your software were to fail and it would cause a catastrophic event, that software needs to be developed to all of the requirements for DAL-A. And then those requirements slowly get lifted as the software is less safety critical all the way to DAL-E where there's no safety impact. The way I like to picture like various ends of the spectrum are, for DAL-E, think about like the in-cabin entertainment, right? If this were to fail, there's no safety impact, the plane can fly fine, you might have some angry customers, but other than that, you're good. Um, all the way down to, to DAL-A, where we're talking about the software that's controlling the actual flight of the airplane. So the flight surfaces, the engine, and so on. Uh, most modern airplanes and cars now are fly-by-wire, meaning when the pilot is using the controls in the cockpit, it's actually sending an electrical signal to some software. That software interprets those signals and then makes a decision based on it to control the actual flight surfaces. So that software is often what we're talking about when we talk about DAL-A software. Um, and that's just opposed to sort of the legacy way to do it where when the pilot would control something, it would be physically connected to the actual output. Additionally, I'll just mention it here quickly, but the Department of Defense has its own standard, MIL standard 882E. It defines five levels of rigor, and uh, it's no coincidence that these map very closely to the five DAL levels. So the Department of Defense, obviously the Air, the Air Force and the Navy have a number of airplanes, and they use similar standards. So why discuss coverage at all? Well, uh, depending on the the level that you're developing your software at for DO-178C, there are a number of coverage requirements. So at DAL-D and E, those less safety critical ones, uh, there are no coverage requirements at all. However, when we get into A, B, and C, which is often called safety critical software, uh, there are requirements added. So for DAL-C, you need to do statement coverage. For DAL-B, you need both statement and decision, so it's additive. And then for DAL-A, you need statement decision, MCDC, and object coverage. And on the following slides, I'll be going into detail about what those different types of coverage actually are. So why is coverage important? Well, at DAL-D, where there are no coverage requirements, the primary focus is really on reliability, which is to say that the software does what's required of it. Um, and you just need to prove that. However, at DAL-A, B, and C, we're additionally focused on safety which means that there's no unintended or untested functionality. And code coverage is one of the tools that we can use to actually find that extraneous, that untested or unintended functionality. So I give this clock as a, a, just a really quick example of 
what unintended functionality might be. So if we have a single requirement for our software system, maybe we're just displaying a clock in the cockpit, and all it needs to do is display the time of day. Um, this clock would be fine if it were assessed at LD, because it displays the time. We have a requirement for the time, and we could test the time. However, if this were a Dell A, B, or C system, this has extraneous functionality, right? It displays the day of the week and the date. So that's the type of thing that, that we can't have. We can't have that extraneous functionality. And obviously, this example is trivial, but when you look at something like the Linux kernel, which is huge and it's not always transparent what all the functionality is, um, code coverage is one of the tools that we can use to find areas of the kernel that we may not have tested or that we may not intend to actually be there. So talking about the different types of source code coverage, I point to this really simple example here. This is C code. Uh, there's a struct. It has three fields for hours, minutes, and seconds. And then there's a single function which tells you if it's valid. So it tests to make sure that the hour is less than 24, the minute less than 60, and seconds less than 60. So the first type of code coverage is statement coverage. This requires that you test every single statement or every single line in the code. Uh, in this example here, there's just a single statement. It's the return statement. So in order to, to get 100% statement coverage of this function, you would just need to call it. It wouldn't even matter what the input was, whether it's valid or not. Um, you're going to get 100% statement coverage of this function. Uh, and statement coverage is required by Del C. Um, next up, decision coverage. So decision coverage requires that you go and you look at every Boolean decision and you verify that each decision is tested and that you make sure that it's evaluated to both true and false. So now you're starting to test more of the edge cases in your code. Um, so in this example, there is additionally just a single decision. So the decision is checking for the validity of the input. And to get 100% decision coverage, we would need to test this, most likely in a unit test or as part of a larger test, with both a valid and invalid time struct. That would cause this Boolean expression to evaluate to both true and false and give us 100% decision coverage. So for example, if you ran your test suite and it showed that you only had 50% decision coverage of this function, you would know that you hadn't tested all of your scenarios. Next up, uh, the last type of source code coverage, MCDC or Modified Condition Decision Coverage. This requires that you look at the actual condition, the conditions inside the decision. So this decision here has three conditions. It has a condition for the hours, the hour check, the minute check, and the second check. So MCDC coverage requires that you go and you look at those individual conditions, check that they evaluate to true and false, and then show that they independently affect the outcome. And on the next slide, I'm going to go into a little bit more detail about what that actually means. So I said that you have to test every condition, and you have to show that it independently affects the outcome. But what does that actually mean? Uh, I think the best way to show this is to look at a truth table for just a really simple decision. So the decision A and B has the following truth table. And the way that we show that condition A independently affects the outcome is we fix everything in place, give it an assigned value, and only change the value of A. And when we do that, we need to prove that the result changes. If we can't prove that, then we, we can't show that A independently affects the outcome, and it must be an extraneous condition inside this decision. So if you look at the first and second line of this truth table, um, B doesn't change. It's fixed at true. However, the value of A changes from true to false. And that actually causes the result of the decision to change from true to false. So this, these pair of truth table entries, and it's always a pair because it's a Boolean, so it can be true and false, these pair prove A's independence. Additionally, for B, uh, we can look at the pair where A doesn't change. So the first and third row, A is true. Only B changes, and the result changes. So th that, those two pairs actually prove B's independence. And it's often written like this, where we say that the pairs true, true, and false, true show A's independence and true, true, and true, false shows Bs. So MCDC really dives into the conditions and makes sure that you're testing all those different combinations. So 
So next up, oh sorry, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so uh, based on what you presented at a slide earlier, okay. what phase of the development that you do the testing? Sorry, could you repeat that? Yeah, the, what stage of the, Oh, yeah. what stage of development? Yeah. So, so it looks like it, a development a coding time you do the test right now. And yeah. also you need to access to the source code as you have like one million line of code. <laughs> yeah, so this is actually one of the huge challenges like, so. Right now we're working with Linux, which obviously all the code already exists, or you know it's changing, but okay. there's a huge code base. So we're looking to go in and apply source code coverage to the existing code with our tests. However, uh -huh. generally, if you were doing this in a forward development situation, you'd want to do it all at the same time. So you'd write your test or your code, you'd write your test to go along with it, and right. then as part of your CI/CD pipeline, it would generate the coverage for you. Okay. And if you have high coverage, it doesn't necessarily imply you have good tests, but it implies that at least you're testing all the functionality inside that code. So at the, at the end of my coding phase, do I need to go to the testing phase with this? It, I would say, yeah, in a traditional waterfall sense, that's how you do it. But in more modern times, it's, it's usually tied together. Like, you'll write code and test at the same time. No, so, for, for Gale, it requires independence. Developers aren't even allowed okay. to do their own testing like this. It has to be a separate, provably independent group that does the testing. So, but yeah, that's a good point. Do yes. Well, it's got to be an independent group that does the testing. So, developers do development. You have a separate test group that does the testing. They come up with the test. So, yeah. Sorry, sorry for that misunderstanding. But yeah. Okay. So the next type of coverage is not focused on the source code at all, but it's focused on the, the object code, or actually the binary that runs on the target, or the machine instructions. Uh, there's a few different ways that it's said. Um, the goal here is really to look into what actually runs on the target. Right? So if we have source code on the left, I think we all know that if we compile this, we're going to get a set of machine instructions. However, the source code can remain exactly the same. You can change your compiler or your tool chain settings, which we've seen with some exploits recently, and you can get a different set of machine instructions. So object code coverage is really focused on making sure that you don't get any of that unintended or untested functionality inside the machine code based on things other than the source code. And so doing this manually by hand obviously would be basically impossible. So there's a number of commercial tools that have been available, and this is traditionally where teams at Boeing have gone to do code coverage. So they'll go to one of these tools. Um, however, these tools have a number of issues. Uh, they're expensive, they're proprietary, and oftentimes they're not the easiest to use. So there's oftentimes training courses or, or onboarding, you know, huge onboarding times to work with these. Uh, and also there's a lot of like getting stuck. When you go with one tool, suddenly that's the tool you're using. More importantly for, for me and for our team, though, uh, we couldn't get these tools to work on the Linux kernel, and we weren't convinced that they would work. Uh, these tools rely on running on top of an operating system. Well, when you're actually trying to instrument the operating system itself, you need to do something different. So instead, we looked at open source tools. So GCOV, along with LCOV for reports, is probably the, the most common one. It's part of GCC. What's great about it is enabling it only requires adding some compiler flags, um, and it supports statement and branch coverage out of the box. Additionally, there's LLVMCOV, which is part of LLVM or Clang. Uh, it requires just compiling with Clang, same thing, enabled with compiler flags, and supports both statement and branch coverage. However, if we're going to pursue one of these open source tools, there's a, there's a few problems or limitations. First of all, they're not qualified. And so qualification is really a process like certification where you prove that your tools are actually reliable, right? If you're going to use the output of the tools to certify your software, you need to make sure that your tools aren't just generating garbage. And this is one of the major advantages of the commercial tools. Uh, additionally, these tools were developed in the community, not necessarily aligned with DO-178C, so their metrics don't always line up exactly to what we need for certification. Additionally, the coverage types of MCDC coverage and object code coverage just aren't supported at all.
So the approach that we took was at the beginning of this school year, we opened up a university research project with UIUC with the goal of enhancing one of these coverage tools to provide up to DALA support. So that is, take an existing coverage tool, add in any of the metrics that we need for DO178C, and add in um, you know, any of the functionality that was missing. And so far, throughout the school year, there's been a lot of great progress made. So they started out by profiling the Linux kernel and to understand like, what our problem space actually was. How many conditions, how many decisions are out there? What do we need our tool to actually measure? And obviously there's hundreds of thousands, if not millions of decisions inside the kernel. So it's quite a big problem space. Um, we down-selected to LLVMCOV as our cho chosen tool. Uh, we felt like it was the most extensible tool, but additionally, there was an open merge request from the folks at Texas Instruments with initial MCDC support for LLVMCOV. So a great head start. It didn't work perfectly, but um, we were able to work, uh, and the university was able to work with, with those uh, patch authors and with the LLVM community to add and enhance the LLVM support, or the MCDC support in LLVM Cove, and get it merged into LLVM 18.1, which came out last month. So you can actually download LLVM, you can run LLVM Cove on your code today, and get MCDC reports out of it. Additionally, there's the challenge of the Linux kernel itself. So we can't just run LLVM Cove as it is, because when it collects its performance data, it has nowhere to store it. It's running on bare metal. So there was an existing patch from 2021 that had been abandoned by, the, by Google to add in PGO, performance guided optimization support to the kernel. And that patch was dropped because uh, there wasn't enough support for it in the community. It was only really for optimization and collecting performance data. And the community felt like there was enough ways to do that already. They didn't need to do it the way that specifically worked with LVM and Clang. However, the UIUC team has actually pulled that patch back. They've updated it. They've pulled it to the latest. They've enhanced it. And now we think that along with the, the performance metrics, but actually being able to collect MCDC coverage on the kernel, there's a good selling point for getting this patch accepted. And I, I think I saw some activity yesterday that they're working on the final steps before they submit that. So I imagine that'll be coming in the next few days. So along with LLVM 18.1 and then that patch, we were able to show that we could collect MCDC coverage on the Linux kernel itself and run through some of the open source test suites that are out there. So K self test, K unit, and a few others to see what it looked like. Um, initial reports of the kernel are like, those tests cover a very small part of the kernel. Like when, we, when we're talking about MCDC support, it's like 1%. So there's a long way to go but at least we now have a tool that can measure it. Here I just wanted to give some example output of what LLVM Cove looks like and what a commercial tool, Vectorcast, looks like for the same you know, inputs. So I took, and it's not here, but there's a simple C program. It has one if check in it, and it has this if check here, if A and B. And I pass the values true, true, and false, true to this function. So I'm expecting that I haven't gotten 100% MCDC coverage, but at least because I varied the value of A, you know, the first condition, that I should see at least MCDC coverage for A. And that does show up here. So when we run LLVM Cove, we get a text-based output. You can also get this as HTML. LLVM Cove points to and assigns names to each of the conditions. So here, condition one is the name that it gives for A. And this is a line and character number which points to that. And condition two is the name it's given to B. And down here, it shows the truth table or, or a representation of the truth table of what it saw executed. So the first entry here is false and a dash. So because it's an and, uh, it's short-circuited, so the second value actually doesn't matter. But this represents the false true pair I passed in, and then the other one was true true. And with these two pairs, LVM Cov shows that our C1 pair is covered. However, our C2 pair is not, so we have 50% MCDC coverage for this uh, expression. 
And on the right, it's the same thing with VectorCast. So VectorCast formats a little bit differently, but you can say that, see the same things here. It's assigned names to each of the conditions. It uses letters as opposed to numbers. And then it prints out the truth table here with asterisks on the rows that were actually hit. So where does that leave LLVM Cove today? So LLVM Cove has a number of advantages, even just today, which is you can run it very easily, right? You just add compiler flags to your build system and you can get MCDC support out. Um, there's no graphical user interface you need to mess with. Um, it's configurable and extensible. And I'll, I'll talk on the next slide about some of those extensions that we're planning. And there's no license costs. Easy to integrate into CICD. This sort of goes along with the previous ones. So the basic idea is in your CICD pipeline, if you have any tests, unit tests or integration tests, you can add these compiler flags to your build. You can run those tests. And then with the, data, the performance data it generates, you can generate your MCDC coverage report. And the nice thing about that is that as you add new tests, you can see what code is actually being covered and how useful those tests are. And the big one for us is really, we've proven that it works on the Linux kernel itself. However, there's still a number of limitations with the LLVM Cub today. Um, first of all, it's not a qualified tool. So that hurdle still needs to be, to be jumped over. Uh, we have plans to qualify it. And similar to like how Zen was talking this morning, um, you know, th they're working on generating all the artifacts. That's really what we need to do. The, the tool exists. We just need to generate the artifacts in order to prove that the tool is reliable. Uh, it does not generate object code coverage and it requires compiling with LLVM and Clang. So this may or may not be a limitation. Many people compile with Clang now. However, there's a bunch of tools in the ecosystem which just assume GCC, so they don't always work with Clang. So we have some patches that we're planning to get all those tools to work with Clang. So finally, uh, what's next? Uh, we made a lot of good progress, but the current implementation of MCDC coverage in LLVM Cov only supports up to six conditions at a time. And we've proven based on our analysis of the kernel that that's not nearly enough. So while this does cover the vast majority, there's still 20 to 30% that are more. So we think we're probably gonna need to double that at least to 12, maybe a little bit more. Um, and we're investigating you know, what's possible. There's some constraints there, right? Like a truth table for two items is small. A truth table for six items gets a lot bigger. When you're going to 12 or 18, suddenly it's intractable. And so we're running this as part of the kernel when we're instrumenting it. We need to make sure it actually works with our use cases. Additionally, there's decision coverage. So LVM Cov only supports branch coverage. Branch coverage seems like it might be decision coverage, but it's a little bit different. So decision coverage is really taking the whole decision itself and seeing whether it evaluates to true or false whereas branch coverage looks at the individual branches in the code, so all the, you know, the, jump, the jump statements in the assembly. Um, and those don't always align one-to-one. -one. However, the team at UIUC has actually put together a patch. Uh, it's, in the, it's in the beta state, I'll say. It works, but we haven't tested it extensively to generate decision coverage from LVM Cov. And that's really based on the work that was done for MCDC coverage. So for MCDC coverage, you have to identify the whole decision anyways, and we think we can reuse that in order to generate decision coverage. Our plan is to, to finish testing that and then upstream that patch, depending on whether there's community support for it. So um, decision coverage is pretty specific to some of the safety standards, so we're not sure if it's more widely applicable. Additionally, there's object code coverage. And this is really our, our big next thing to tackle. Um, and this is what we're gonna focus on throughout the next year. So object code coverage in a lot of the tools, it doesn't give you a lot of useful metrics. It's often difficult to read. It's often difficult to use. So we're looking at how we can actually use LVM Cov to generate object code coverage. We've done some initial like very early tests and proven that it is possible, but we still don't know what this looks like. And there's a lot of work to be done here. So with that said, that's what I had today. Um, thanks everyone. Do you have any, any questions, any comments? 
Yes, we have tried it, and we've. Yeah, we've actually run. Uh, the question was, have we tried this? And yeah, we've actually run it on the Linux kernel. So, on the kernel. On the kernel. Yeah, we've tried it both in an emulator in QMU and on bare metal. And we were able to collect data based on some simple tests like uh, K self test, K unit, and a few other just open source test suites. Um, Um, I'm trying to remember the configuration we used. It was a smaller kernel. It wasn't like just a general purpose one, but it wasn't, it wasn't all no. It wasn't like the tiniest that you could get it. I guess I have used some of the tools and uh, it takes a long time. <laughs> and yeah. Actually, when you get into the object arena, then even with the current processing power, it takes overnight. <laughs> Yeah, uh, even the, the source code base coverage does slow down the process a fair bit. Um, LVM Cov as it stands now, it will work, and we've actually proven that it, it will be suitable for running tests on. But yeah, we haven't gotten the object code coverage yet, so there, there are some concerns there with performance. Yeah, new algorithm that... I did the research on that, and I provided the algorithm, and the people use that, and it spit up, I don't know, big percentage. I don't want to disclose that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah okay. I appreciate it. Thanks. All right, I got a question for you. I'll, I'll lead the witness here a little bit. Okay. So you've heard the phrase, racing improves the breed, right? Okay. So all this work that's being done by Boeing, um, can you – Speak to a little bit, if you're prepared to, like how, how does this benefit the rest of the open source community, even people not in the safety critical world? Why would they, why would they care? Yeah, I think that the testing is a good example. So there's a lot of test suites that are out there, and people write tests, they do their best, and they try to test the things that they, they can, but it's often not clear like what, test, like what the tests are actually testing. And I think coverage data is a good way to, to view, you know, when you write a new test, what, does, what actually happens? Like, what are you actually hitting? Uh, the other one, which I think is interesting, is the object code coverage. Um, object code coverage will show things where, like, there are supply chain attacks. If somebody puts in a merge request and says, I'm just updating the documentation, I'm just reordering the build scripts, and all of a sudden you notice there's this new object code that's been inserted. Uh, the object code coverage, I think, would be a great way to expose some of those things. So I see its use in security as well. Also, it's worth noting that, I, if I'm not mistaken, I think it's SQLite. They, uh, they actually have MCDC coverage uh, built into their code base. Okay. I think it's the only one, if not mistaken. No, okay, I'm getting a little... For the SQLite, they have MCDC coverage, but they don't try to get to 100% because they found they prefer having robustness code to avoid bugs that is just untestable with MCDC. But I'm not involved in any way, it's just from reading blog posts. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. So like, testing for coverage is one thing. Testing for robustness and having good tests is another thing. And they often intersect, but they're not exactly the same thing. So you can write a really good test that um, gets great coverage, you could also write a really bad test that gets good coverage. However, if you're writing good tests, you're usually getting higher coverage. So there is some correlation there. And I have a question. Why did you choose exactly LLVM Cov instead of GCov, for example? So part of it was that the MCDC support had been started. Part of it was also we were looking to move to LLVM and Clang if we could. Um, we thought it would be easier to implement a number of things outside of code coverage in that ecosystem, but we actually thought when it came to adding object code coverage that that would be easier. Because uh, you're right, in a lot of ways, Linux and the kernel is already set up for GCC. It's really easy now to collect coverage with uh, GCC and GCOV. So uh, we just felt like the trade-offs were worth it there. Thank you. Um, I have a question. Um, are you, I mean, do you plan to also push tests upstream, like in case of tests, key units? 
because, I mean, because, I mean, indeed, you know, the, the I'm, I'm, I mean, measuring coverage indeed is great, right? But, you know, if we extend, you know, the, the baseline of testing that we have available upstream, I believe, and also if we maybe improve the, the quality of the tests themselves, right? Yeah. That is, I believe, the, where we have the, the, the huge, you know, value for, for the whole community. Yeah, so we do have plans to push upstream the tests. I think the one thing uh, we're not sure of and we probably won't, wouldn't push upstream would be like requirements or other architectural documentation. But the tests and the code changes, like if we were to find any issues or redundancies based on our, our analysis, those are the things that we would push upstream. And I think we're in the process of doing that now. So like we've written some runtime tests that run through uh, BitBake and we're planning to upstream those here. Okay, thanks. Okay, no more questions. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.